drink it while you're drinking your Diet Coke. Good. That's a nice <laughs> opening shot of me. Oh, you know what? Um, I'm sorry. I know that we're on, but we mm-hmm. could um, – we have to just double check. It said free to prime till 111, so I'm assuming that's okay. all the time. Yeah. I'll double check. Also, I have to make – we're planning Friday. Hello Hi, for anyone everybody. who's here. Hi. Um, we know that we're on. We're aware <laughs> that we're talking to you also when you can hear yeah. us. Um. No, we're planning out Friday's show. We, I also, I want to make cookies because I have to take some Ooh. shots of our merch. Oh, um, nice. and I want to yeah. include cookies in that. I thought and, you were um, saying you have to get shots, and you wanted to drink, like, to eat cookies while you were getting a shot in the arm. Yeah, when I, you know, I bake <laughs> cookies for myself when I go get my flu shot. <laughs> um, and then I bring them to the doctor's office, and I'm like, just, I'm just gonna have one in my mouth. <laughs> um, just let me know when you're ready. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go. Um, mm-hmm. and then just shove a cookie in my mouth so that I can't. Yeah. My so brain don't works my very fast. So whatever you say, I'm going to jump on, like, a, I'm going to go with it in a very, in whatever direction my brain wants to go. That's why we're so good at improv. Yeah. Because now <laughs> we are, we are, we did a show in a cemetery for mm-hmm. tens of people. For tens of people. That was Actually, good, it was about 30 people. Yeah, it was, was a good, good show. I really good liked that group. I'm sad that it's, was a one time. I really love having a three mad rituals group. That's like my favorite form to do. It's so hard to <laughs> do that on Zoom. Right. I yeah. I think people yeah. would be like, what is happening? Yeah. I think you could you could probably do like what Seinfeld did if you're brilliant and make um, like a TV show that mimics the the, the form. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think it was a good know. show. Oh, thank you. Silly 522. Oh. We uh, we loved that show. We miss it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe. You know what? When we can get back to going to places and you know when it gets warm again that was an outdoor show we did that at laurel hill cemetery i know that was it so, that isn't that was an outdoor show like i felt it um, we oh so this was improv this wasn't crime and cookies oh i would that love would to do a crime fun, though you know what i contacted laurel hill and then um i think the world fell apart well uh, no, it was like a year later that the world fell apart but we never like by the we had plans for later to talk about crime and cookies and mm-hmm. then the world fell apart. Yeah. So we could always um we could always go back when the world puts itself back together. It's um, um yeah. Yes, optimistically this year. <laughs> I think. I think, but I don't want to get ahead of myself because um like I thought it, I think I told you it, I thought it was going to be like a Thanos snap like everything's back. But <laughs> it's not. The news is still stressful. The world is still weird and so I'm like it's not as fast as I thought but that's okay it it still can turn itself around right it's the intention Mm -hmm. it's the intention I feel yeah I feel a little different um a little motivated I did I did a crazy thing um but it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's not crazy. It's. I did. I did a very vulnerable thing. I went and out to a person. I called my boss. Oh. So Ooh. yeah, I. I don't know how much of the story I want to tell, but I started down this road, and I owe you people. <laughs> you have to say something. So, just no, I gotta tell. So, just lie. It's fine. We don't know. <laughs> so when I got when I got fired in April, I got fired by a boss who literally told me, "I will never fire you," and also you are in my lifeboat and I'm taking you with me wherever I go. Mm. So that's why I was blindsided. And then um, when it happened, I was like, can, can you, can you, can I talk? When, so I got fired in bed on a conference call while I was in my underwear, which I think is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it happened, I was like, well, can I talk to her? I was to the other like person on the call or persons who knows who are firing me. Only two of them spoke. Um, can you imagine if the HR person was on the call and just didn't just like sat there anyway, digression. So I was like, I was obviously upset and was like, can I talk to her? Cause we're like close. And uh, the other guy was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get off the line. And then I was like, well, what happened? Like, what's going on? Like, what can you can talk to me? Tell me what happened. And she was like, I can't give you information that might get out. You know, we got other things to do whatever. And I was like, fine, but can we talk later? And she's like, yes, when this calms down, we will talk later. She never called me. It was nine months and I have been completely messed up about it. Like it's, it comes up in therapy a lot because I know Harrison, you'll remember we've talked about my trust issues. So now like, how are you going to do that to someone who has trust issues? Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, yesterday, I got a news bulletin that she had been fired. So, because they eliminated her position. And so I called. I called her. Because I had the overwhelming urge. And that's the only reason. And I was like, and I was like, no, I'm not. Whatever. Let her come to me. And then my brain was like, you know what? New year, new you. Go with that urge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. How did it go? Well. Good. Not as good. I mean, I already knew that she was never going to say anything that's going to make me feel all the way better. Yeah, like yeah. there's no such thing as closure. There's none. Right. Um, but you know what? It, it wasn't bad. And we might still have a, a working relationship. So that's good. good. Yeah. And other stuff like I don't want to say. But Yeah, no, that's cool fine. Stuff, but but yeah. I think, you know what? You just have to do that. You have to act on like how you're feeling, you know? Um, in yeah. the moment, I did. oh my god, I started crying halfway through leaving her a voicemail, and I was like, mm -hmm. oh my god, I'm so so. I'm leaving this voicemail. I'm like, hi, I heard you got fired. I think that's stupid. It's a tragedy. You're great, and I'm, I know we haven't talked. It's so long, and now I'm being weird, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it was very emotional. My therapist was very proud of me. Yeah, um, that's good. That's really good, and it like. You know, because there's probably a lot of things that she couldn't say at the time that now she might be able to tell you. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll how see. I mean, we're both looking for jobs, so we need to keep that dirt close. To yeah. The best yeah exactly. <laughs> but I mean, like, it's good now that you've reconnected. I'm glad right. because that was a really hurtful and upsetting thing for you. So it was. Yeah, I told Gina a lot more than I'm telling all of you. Um. <laughs> I don't know anything. She's lying. I'm just. This is the first anyone has heard that I lost my job. I, I know. Put on such a brave face. I did a thing yeah. where I um, reached out to someone who just like every at every turn, and I didn't do it like I did it more of like in a group set, a group chat of like a hey, congrat! I noticed this, congrats. And I got shot down, and oh. this person like regularly shoots me down. Oh, thank you, one hundred RPM. You too. Um, have a great 2021. So then I had that, I have, I'm having the, all those, like, I hate, I hate the feeling of the new year. That is the, I like a new year. I like a new start, but I hate the feeling of like thinking of all the old and like rehashing it in my brain and like, like all those feelings of like not feeling good enough, people like not liking me. Like I just like at the beginning, at the beginning of the year, it's kind of like the highlights reel, but the worst highlights <laughs> that I play in my head. And I'm in that phase of just like, I don't have, you know, what's my purpose in life? Why don't Aww. people like me? And like, I reached out in like a very, I thought like softball way. And this person was just like, no, no, uh -oh. I don't. I'm never going to like be nice to you. And I just feel, ugh, I feel yucky this week. Oh, but that's on them though. It is. At least they were honest with you and now you know. And the thing is, it's part of my, I don't know what you want to call it, where I keep giving people chances who don't deserve it. Yeah. Um, it's just part of my, I guess, history. And I just need to like, I think I, for me, I just need to recognize that some people like that's, you just have to let some people go. Mm -hmm. like they're just not going to like you and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah. What helps me out with that is thinking about all of the people that I don't like <laughs> and that's okay. No, not to me. and that's okay. If right. I'm allowed to not like people, people are allowed yeah. to not like me, not in a mean way, but there's just like, there are people at work mm -hmm. and people around who I'm never going to be friends with. And right. we, we get along for work's sake and I don't like them, mm -hmm. but and that's fine. It's just because I don't like them. And that's just my opinion. And it's yeah. it doesn't make them bad. It doesn't mean I can or won't work with them. Right. Don't really treat them any different. What helps me out with that is the <laughs> coconut <laughs> duh. Oh, that is nice. Thank that you. is perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. I'm going to going to do that too. Yeah, well, that's yeah. nice. That makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a weird thing that I, and I need to like stop it because it's not like stop going after people who have like clearly said like I don't really like you or clearly made it obvious that they don't like you. Like you don't have to you can't make people like you, so stop. Right. 
and stop playing the negative highlights reel at the all the time of all the yeah. things that you think you're bad at because you're probably not as I'm probably not as bad at them as I think I am but I no. have it in my brain I guarantee you you're not just from knowing you, you're not as bad as you think you are so I think too one thing that helped me recently on like my favorite murder I think it was like a, I say recently it's like a couple months ago uh Karen was talking about how her therapist said like I think about this all the time ever since she said it, that her therapist said, like, sometimes you're just reliving an old trauma, like, and that thing or that, and she's, I'm not saying it as eloquently as she said, but basically that already happened. The trauma already happened. And that was the worst part of it. You reliving it is like poking at the pain Mm -hmm. of something that's, that already was bad. Like it's never going to be as bad as it was in the moment. So stop going back to it. Like you're not, the only thing you're getting from going back to it is poking at old pain. That's not, that's never going to be as bad as it was in the moment, if that makes sense. And so I'm like, yeah, why, like I relive old hurts to like punish, I think punish myself a little bit. And it's like, why, why do you want to do that? Like it was bad then. Why do you want to relive how bad something was? It's done. It's over and done. I'm a wallower too. I will definitely wallow. And it's just, it doesn't serve me. Like right. yelling doesn't. So try to shut it down. But I think like, I think you have to work through your trauma. I don't think you should ignore it. But at the same time, at a certain point, I don't think the wallowing right. helps. So it's like a balance in there, I think. You want to hear a cool thing I learned this week on Witch Talk? Yeah. Okay. On Witch TikTok? Okay. This is, so this is supposed to be, it's supposed to, um, you're supposed to do it before you do any work um, um, to like clear the space and ground it and like, <clears throat> you know, not have any negative energy, whatever. Yeah. Repeat cycles of trauma. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so what you're supposed to do to cl- like clear the space that you're in is you're supposed to say um, any thoughts, emotions, idea or ideas that do not belong to me and are not from me are not welcome in my space. Hmm. And I like, I don't do witchcraft practice, but hearing that and like hearing that as an affirmation and a mantra, I was like, oh, okay. So that also means like other people's opinions. Yeah. Yeah. Or like what other people's expectations are what they think of me. Mm -hmm. They're not welcome in my space. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Get out. And then you you get to go through that rabbit hole of what is actually your thoughts and feelings and what is someone else's that just got stuck in there and couldn't find a way out. That's then that's where I get stuck is all those thoughts. Plus the like, what am I good at? What am I on this earth? What am I meant to do? You know, all that stupid shit that like I think about all the time. And then I watch that movie soul, which is basically like a person and have a good, have good relationships and like being alive is your purpose. And I'm like, Oh, that's beautiful. But seriously, what's my purpose? (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, that's fine. And I love it. And it's really nice, but hi, help me out. (laughs) Yeah. And so like, it's funny. It's, uh, it's funny that like, I don't know why I'm, I always come back to that, but I guess everybody does. Everybody's like, wants to know like what they're, why they're here, what they're doing. Maybe until you figure it out. Maybe not everybody doesn't, but I do. Once you get to a certain age, <laughs> you look around and you're like, what am I doing? Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. That's how it, fe- it feels. You just feel like, I like, what's the thing? Like, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> what the hell yeah. am I doing? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. So I read, um, we're, we're creeping towards our, tonight we're talking about a case. It's a, it's not a one case. It's eight cases. It's called the Jeff Davis eight. And so, um, I have been consuming, I, I, I saw another documentary on this a while ago and then I always had it in the back of my thought, but I'm like, that story is so complicated. I don't even know that I can tell it. And then I just got a feeling like I wanted to, but anyway, so this week has been like, cons- so I was listening to American Sherlock and I still am. I have like mm-hmm. two hours left, but I put it on hold for this week. That book and- is also in our Amazon if you want to buy it yeah. after you've yeah. talked a lot about it. I almost did today. <laughs> I was it's looking so at good. it. It's so good. It's just, I don't know why. It just made me, even though it's about crimes, it makes you feel good. But um, yeah. cause just because it's like historical and cool, like you're learning yeah. cool stuff. But um, 
the Jeff Davis eight is so depressing <laughs> that I honestly, I think that was is part of my problem this week is that okay. like I consumed so much about it that mm -hmm. like trigger warning, like if you're going to read about it, don't watch the documentary in the same week you read the entire book. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> like um, it's very, very, it's very good. Good. And we'll, I'll get into it. But um, so I've been like, sometimes I get like, you know, cause we have such a short turnaround time to, to get, to prepare. And I always like to, if I can find a book, I'll read a book or listen to a book, but once in a while, a crime, they're all terrible, but once in a while it like is, it like is overwhelming. And this was like that kind of a week. So I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like it's like all consuming, like all of my thoughts. So I kind of can't wait to talk about this <laughs> to be like cool. get it out. And then we have another show on Thursday, but it's about a different, um, one so it's not as like it's still it's still sad but it's not as like all consuming yeah. so hopefully i won't that will be on facebook live for one of our library patrons yeah. so that won't be on twitch um it won't but we will um advertise for it so if you look at our socials you'll see yeah. all the info for that and that'll be fun. that springfield township library yeah. like the tradefrin library has been good to us and so follow us on yeah. at crime and cookies facebook insta twitter oh yeah. um do you wanna do you wanna hear something else fun that I've been excited to show you? Um, yeah. And I didn't do it in our green room beforehand because I want you to want everyone to see your honest reaction. I got some more of my merch samples. Ooh. Here's this mug. Oh, I Isn't love that it. cute? Yeah, that is cute. There's a lot of glare on it, but it says "Watch True Crime and Eat Cookies." Yummy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also got. I don't know how to show you this T-shirt, but we're just gonna try it out. Um, okay. <clears throat> The True Crime is My Self-Care t-shirt. Oh, I love it. You can't see self-care because it's a white t-shirt and my webcam is like, oh my God. Oh, um, so I was like, what do you mean yeah. you're going to share it? Now I get it because you're wearing it, right? I'm wearing yeah. Um, yeah, so this, and this, I like this t-shirt. I got an extra large, but I could have gotten a large. So they're like big mm. and it's long. It's really long. Ooh, like it like goes that. down below my butt. So yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. that's what you like in a t-shirt. I like that in a t-shirt. I do like um, that in a t-shirt, but I like I the butt covered. <laughs> yeah. And it's nice and like soft and it looks really cute. It looks really, really cute. You can't see the pink. It's in pink, but um, maybe I need a better webcam. It's like, I'll just let it all. I, I thought it looked good. I could see it. Okay. Too. Yeah. So it so, looks good. I am. And this is also on mugs and um, phone cases and... <clears throat> Pouches and t-shirts and and it's hoodie. a true statement. It is right. literally one a big part of my self care. Right, exactly. Someone, someone asked me yesterday because I posted a, our show teaser on Twitter, and someone asked me if I just like comedy or if I was into true crime, and I was like, "Come on, <laughs> uh, both." <laughs> right, like so. No, I, I, um, I, I didn't realize I was only had one interest. <laughs> I hate true crime and I don't want to talk about it except all the time. <laughs> right. Except for hours on my show. But other than that. Right. Oh, and subscribers get a merch discount. I emailed you if you're a subscriber, right. your merch right. discount. That is correct. Um, oh, and if your mom is here, I feel like she would have said hi if she was. Yes, but I put, in, I put t shirts for her yeah. with the logo. Oh, nice. Okay. So, so like that. She'll be yeah. Happy. Oh boy, I was trying to think. Oh, so tonight's like a big lottery. Oh, the drawing already happened. So if any of you are millionaires, you might be just logging out immediately. Oh, was it Powerball? Pa it was Mega. Mil I don't understand the lottery. Mega Millions. It was. Um, I don't really believe in the lottery. That is, but when it's the it's that big, I buy a ticket. But I didn't leave my house today. But um, Mike told me that um, I could buy my ticket online, and I was like. If I was a gambling addict, this would be very dangerous. Yes, I know what it's so it was so easy. I mean, I only I buy I play the lottery maybe twice a year, and it's because yeah. of like when it's too big. I just buy like a ticket because I'm like, right. well, you know, why not? Yeah. Um, and it was like scary how easy it was. And wow. when I was in college, I had a boyfriend who worked at the Seven Eleven and one of the Seven Elevens in the city. I think it was in Cheltenham, but I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, he always told me like about people's like heavy addiction into the lottery. Like it's, people are heavily yeah. addicted. So I, even though I was like so proud that I could just do it, like I could never leave the house. I just thought how many people are doing this on their phone every day? Cause you deposit money in from your like 
Ooh. Or a source. And then you play. Have it. enough to. And like, how many people are dumping hundreds of dollars? Right. It made me, like, ner- it made me nervous. I think right. it's too much that you can get it on your phone. You can't. On your phone? phone. <laughs> That's what my mom said. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> we would do work pools when it got to be really big. So I don't know. That would always be really fun. Yeah. I'd be on the air like, if you tune in tomorrow and none of us are here, it's because mm-hmm. we won. Um, yeah. We would definitely all quit today. Honestly, it's one of they say it's one of the worst things that could happen to you is winning the lottery. Mm-hmm. And there's a story. Maybe I don't. I don't want to give it away because maybe one of us will do it. But um, there is at, there's at least one true crime, pretty popular true crime story about a lottery winner who is sort of swindled. Oh um, yeah. yeah, I feel like there's also an episode of the Happiness Lab about it. Oh really? The Happiness Lab is an amazing podcast that you should listen to. I know I it's should. About, <laughs> Please tell me that. Like, it's happiness. about things that you are that we do that we think make us happy that actually don't. Um, no, I will not show your feet. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> no. Or you put a bunch of bits in, and maybe I'll change my mind. We have a sub goal. Um, <laughs> we. <laughs> I'm on right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so the happiness lab is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, no, and no. I listen to it. Well, no. Oh, well, I don't see any bits, dude. I don't see no. you paying any money for any feet. What are you trying to get feet for free? Get out of here. You can go on <laughs> foot. What is it? Yeah, foot media? Yeah. Wiki feet. Go to Wiki. Wiki feet. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, listen to the happiness lab. It's very, very good. I will. I always like, what can I listen to? And then I'm like, a terrible book? Podcast? <laughs> Click. Right. Um, I know. Well, one of my students, tell me what you think. So my students are, are college aged. Some of them are high school students, but they're taking college classes like they're at whatever. Age. Yeah. But I think like I in my head, I'm like high when I think high school, I'm thinking like little babies, but they're they're not. They're advanced. <laughs> Some people. of them can drive. Yeah, I know. I'm not because I have a child and it, you know. But yeah. anyway, so um and when you see them, they look like babies. But anyway, so I'm go. I'm doing. I just made the executive decision that I'm doing Lost Girls and the Long Island serial killer with Ooh. them as the text. Do you think that's too much? Probably not. I gave them a trigger warning in the syllabus and in the course, so they know when they sign up, like when they know when they get the syllabus, like this is what we're reading. I think it's fine. I don't think there's anything untoward in there. In fact, a lot of them are writing about just like, like how, like a lot of them have written really moving things about what they've written. So, I mean, what they've read. So I think it's okay. Harrison says too much. Too much? Really? Too much? I don't. You know what's funny? We did the Khalif Browder story, like the documentary, and they thought that was too much. Well, I think think that's a a good. Less. And I think that's the story that they should hear. But I figured in a year with George Floyd, I did. I took a break from that only because of for my black students, I didn't want to overwhelm them with right. more of right. Like so, I, um, I took a, a break the teenage girl. <laughs> there's nothing really like there's. It's more or less like I don't think there's anything really. They don't describe anything in there. They just basically talk about their lives. I don't know. So if they thought the Khalif Browder story was too, I mean, that's upsetting. I guess it's a different kind of upsetting. I don't know. I don't know. It People might be too having complaints. So I think it's okay. Yeah. The Khalif Browder, I think they, uh, they're they upset because the documentary episode three, it, I don't know if anyone's watched it, is really tough. That's where they show people in solitary confinement cutting themselves. And that is a little bit hard. It's Yeah. But, it's a very upsetting. It's, it's good. It's well made. Yeah. Um, and a lot of students, my so students like a, a lot of my students wanted to like they were really into it and they liked the um, the theme of like prison reform. But uh, you could see my cat licking me, which is really great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it was the documentary is it's very you know what it is it's just very emotional and very traumatic and it's forcing you to to see something that's going on in American society that it's easy to ignore yeah. if you don't look at it. Whereas like Lost Girls is more an examination of, you know, like what do you do uh, with sex workers? Not what do you do, but you know what I mean? That's a terrible yeah. question. It sounds, that came out wrong. But yeah. <laughs> what do you do with when they go missing and nobody cares until it's a, it's a, 
Right. You know, so we're t- basically talking about that stuff. There's nothing really – there's not really anything in there that I think is like so – I thought that Lost Girls was like really – for as much as it talks about their lives, there's nothing in in there that's really like un like gory or like graphic. They were dismembered, but they don't talk about. No, the dismembered ones were the one were the bodies that they found, the other bodies that were found. But it's they in were, the book. It's not that one's not in the that's not oh. really in the book. It's like lightly in the book. It's in the pod. It's in the podcast. Okay. It's mostly about the women. It, there, it's lightly in the book, but it doesn't really go into heavy, heavy stuff. Like the podcast is a little bit more. Anyway, I don't I know. Just think people thought I kind of just dive, dove in and I thought, well, if someone yells at me, I'll stop. Yeah. Yeah. Do they get, do they have options if it's too much for them to I not do anything not. else? Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Just like I was planning on with my, my other class going back to Khalif Browder, but giving them an option if they don't like, like 13, they can watch 13th instead, which is like mm. less intense of a documentary. Like yeah. I'm planning on giving them a lot of options so that they can pick and choose the ones that are, I yeah. personally think they should watch it, but I don't know. Some one people girl, can't. One girl was in um, a an in, was in, was in an institution, so the the solitary confinement was way mm-hmm. too much for her. And I told mm-hmm. her, I was like, mm-hmm. I understand completely. Well, I'll give you something. Yeah, and you always have to think too that some of your students may have relatives that are in jail yeah. or were in jail. So yeah. it's like you never know. You never know right. who right who's. So that's who why I, like, I yeah. always give ahead of time a warning. I tell them up front, and I offer alternatives. Good, good. That sounds like a good practice. There's no alternative to tonight. You just have to not. There's watch. no, I'm yeah, sorry. tonight it's either you're watching this. There's no nice one. That. So I read the book. So to to give you an idea, I gave I read the book um Orfoot Friend Left. Oh. Oh wow. Uh, <laughs> well, if you're not gonna pay for feet, you're not gonna get feet, man. I mean, I don't know what you think you're doing there. Um Blah, 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 feet. Okay. Uh, like, Murder, um, feet. Uh, um, so this week or this t- of time around, I read a book called Murder in the Bayou by Ethan Brown. And then I also watched a documentary uh, called, I think it's called Murder in the Bayou, but of course, I'll put it up for you. And we were debating watching the first episode on um, Friday, actually. Yeah. Um, or part of it. I think it's not. Yeah, I think it would be. We'd be able to watch it and still have a time. Uh, so anyway, it's um, the documentary is also by him, and I have to tell you, he is an he is a an investigative reporter, and he's very just excellent at what he does. I mean, he really uncovers everything, and he's going into a town where. The town, so it's a town called Jennings in Louisiana, and um, it's in um, what? So I, from what I understand, counties are called parishes. Yes, in Louisiana, they are. It's hard to think of a of a parish as like a county, and it's in um, Jefferson Davis County, which is um, abbreviated a lot by people for Jeff Davis. Um, we and, had this talk before, right? Yeah. We had this talk before we went on. I didn't know who um, Jeff Davis was, and apparently he was a Confederate president of the Confederacy for a short time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm, 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 Andrea, I'm not up on my Confederacy knowledge. It's a, How do you know which statues to go pull down when we're doing our Antifa? I don't <laughs> I don't know. I just, just pull pulling out people down. left and right. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought because Gina posted I'm doing the Jeff Davis eight, and I thought that sounds like a jazz band. Jeff Davis must be a person. And she was like, No, it's a county. And I'm like, that's the Confederate president. Mm-hmm. Um, Which I just yeah. didn't think about. I figured it was some old timey Louisiana person, and I just stopped at that. I mean I should have was listened to yeah. together. In my brain, I'm, I, I would be like, well, why would they hate? Why wouldn't they change it? But again, naive. Listen. <laughs> uh, so when she told me, I was like, oh, that makes that makes sense. And that's probably, I think, I'm guessing that's why they shorten it to Jeff Davis. Also, Jefferson is a long name. 
Yeah. Um, but the women are typically known as the Jeff Davis eight. Most places they're either called the Jeff Davis eight or the Jeff, the Jennings eight. Cause Jennings is the actual town. Oh, okay. Um, where, so it's confusing. Cause like, it's weird because like it, they really seem to always refer to the parish instead of the town where here, I feel like you mostly refer to the town. You don't necessarily, unless it's Delco. It depends. Yeah, unless right. So it depends. So there's yeah. Delco. And then if you're from Washington Township, you say you're from Township. Oh, um, I never knew that. So you're from Washington Township. You don't, no one says they're from Sewell, which okay. you're from Sewell. Shut up. Um, uh, Cause they're snobs. Um, we always said Williamstown, that's where we grew up, but, um, yeah, no, it, depends. it depends. Yeah. So they really, they really just, but they really just call them the Jeff Davis eight. I will tell you with this crime, it's just sad. Um, I'm tr I'll try to be, there's a lot of goriness just because the bodies were found in like states of, um, decomp and, um, but, and some of the, I'll just tell you the life stories are just generally sad and the situation there is sad. Um, and that there are, there is rape in the story and there's just sort of like an unrelenting sense of hopelessness. Okay. <laughs> um, fun. <laughs> trigger warning for unrelenting fun. sense of hopelessness, which I don't <laughs> think I've ever said before. Uh, but that's the feeling that you get from this story. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but it's very interesting and compelling. And I hope you'll stick with it. If for nothing more than these women and this town really deserves attention and change. And I'm shocked that more people don't know this and talk about it. And, that, and more people aren't just furiously angry that the that everything that goes on there went on and still goes on there and that nothing, nothing changes. So, um, so that just gives you like a, a an overview. So um, I told Andrea ahead of time that this is like, usually I tell one, it's usually like pretty much a, a an overarching story. This is like several stories. So I'm going to try my best. So please bear with me. Okay. There's so much information and there's so many people. And also I only, will tell you, I'll try to only tell you the names of people that matter. You might need a notebook. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. <laughs> you remember, just ask me like, who the hell is that? And I will yeah. tell you because it's, it is, there's a lot of people and it can get overwhelming. Like I told Andrea, I didn't memorize the names of any of the boyfriends because like. Good. Who cares? Uh, they're inconsequential, to be honest with you. I just like, and they have nicknames. Everyone has a nickname. So it's not like I could memorize a straightforward name. They're all nicknames. Um, okay. So on May 20th of 2005, um, a man named Jerry Jackson, who was uh, a retiree, was uh, going to, uh, going, we're planning to, um, or not planning to, was, sorry, fishing at the, off of a bridge over the Grand Marais Canal on the outskirts of Jennings in Southwest Louisiana. Um, earlier in the day or week, I'm not hundred percent clear. He had seen um, a news report about someone stealing a whole bunch of mannequins. And so as he is fishing, he sees what looks like a mannequin and thinks that this is related to that news story. But then when he looks closer, he realizes that there are flies buzzing around a mannequin and that flies wouldn't mm. do that. Yeah. So he, um, he panicked and he went and dialed 911 from his phone and uh, more than a dozen deputies and de detectives from the, um, from the Jeff Davis parish sheriff's office arrived and hours later, um, it was determined that there was a woman, um, the, the, the dead woman was a woman called a 28 year old Loretta Lynn Chasson. Um, and her technical name is Loretta Lynn Chasson Lewis. Cause she was married, but she was estranged from her husband. Um, she was in blue jeans, blue panties. I hate that word. I, me too. I, I hate it. Blue you underwear. don't have to say it. It's your write up. You can say underwear. Oh, I copied and pasted that word and I'm like, oh, why am I saying it? Blue <laughs> underpants for the <laughs> thank you. For the moment. And a white short sleeve blouse. Um, her body was decayed and didn't really show any any sign of injury except there was a small patch of blood on her scalp. And her fingerprints identified her, like I said, as 20, 28 year old Loretta Chesson. 
Chasson. Um, so about Loretta, or earlier in that day, actually, a um, uh, warden from the um, local jail showed up. His name's Terry Gilroy, and you're going to hear his name a lot. He shows up at Loretta's home, and he asks her, I think it's her brother, it's her brother or her mom, he asks them if they've seen Loretta. Now, her family doesn't even know that she's missing at this point. And they're like, no, we haven't seen her. And then um, he goes over to a friend's house and asks the same thing. And they're like, we haven't seen her. And then later that day, she's found dead. So they're Mm -hmm. so... Keep that in the back of your mind as well um, as there's Loretta is a sex worker in um, Jeff, Jeff David or in Jennings. Sorry, I'm going to get them confused. They're She's, both the same place. Same place. <laughs> She's same a place. sex worker in Jennings. And according to the author and most of what I'm, everything that I'm saying is really according to Ethan Brown, who's done all this work. So um, it's coming through his, his extensive and excellent research. But Loretta had lived, she was married uh, to a man and they had, you know, they started having problems when she started having dr- using drugs and their marriage fell apart. They had, I think, four sons together. I swear, mm-hmm. One of them has four, one of them has two. And I think she had two, I think it was two. I think they had two sons together. But anyway, they were estranged. They never got divorced. And in fact, her husband is so upset with the police investigation because they never investigated him. And that's how you oh, know yeah. the husband's like a good guy. Right. Because he's like, why didn't why didn't they ask me anything? Like, I'm the husband. I'm the first person that you would right. suspect. And he's like, and they didn't ask me. But basically, they never divorced because he would sort of like help her out with money and stuff like that yeah. when he needed it. But she was just on a bad path and – all of these women, all of the Jeff Davis eight were sex workers in the area of Jennings and were deeply, deeply into drugs. And it was really the drug trade that fueled the sex work, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it wasn't the kind of thing where they fell in needing money, like needing money for to pay for um, their homes or stuff like that. It started with we started using drugs. We came, we got more and more into drugs and then somebody sort of started turning them out to get the drug. Like if you want drugs from me, then you have to sleep with these yeah. folks and then you can get, I'll give you drugs. And so that's kind of how it all happened for all of them, um, which is ter- terribly awful. There's also the author points out, he doesn't go into details about their mental health issues, but he's, most of the girls have some sort of um, yeah. mental health issue. I think, Loretta was bipolar, um, and a couple of the girls were. Not to say that it has one has anything to do with the other, but the combination of things. Um, and so another Loretta, like all the women, had spent a lot of time in her life or her later life around this time period in jail. And one of her cellmates had come forward and said that she had been having sex with the warden. Um, oh shit! Gordon was coming in and sort of like not that she was. I should say the other way around. She wasn't having right. Sex with Gordon, so that was is- yes, that was an assault because she is not able to consent exactly. Fully. Yeah, and so <clears throat> that's the person who showed up at the her house asking where she oh. was. Wait, the warden? Yeah, Terry Gilroy. He's kind of. It's weird there. He's even though he's a warden, like usually I think of the warden like at the jail, like locked up right. in there in a separate thing. He's right. kind of like an all about town guy who gets people like on one hand, people really like him because he gets them out of jams and help tries to help people and is like a buddy to peep to everybody. And then on the other hand, he's involved in all this stuff that you'll see is really Yeah shady like and if he's looking for her after she got out of jail yeah that yeah that insinuates some not good stuff happening exactly so loretta has and unfortunately with all these women a series of just terrible experiences in in terms of just like heavy drug use hanging out and with um there's a there's a very high like very 
um, strong contingency of sex workers who all know each other, hang out Mm -hmm. in the same places, get their drugs essentially from the same people, um, have spent time in the same jails. So it's kind of like almost like a a sub-society, right, Mm -hmm. people. So, um, so between 20, 2005 and 2009, there will be seven more bodies discovered in the swamps and canals of Jennings. Wow. Um, and I'm going to name the women all together and then I'm going to go through them. Uh, Ernestine, there's Laura, Loretta. Um, she was the first. Then there was Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson. There's Kristen Gary Lopez, Whitney Dubois, Laconia Muggy Brown. Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno, Brittany Gary, and Nicole Guillory. And if Guillory sounds familiar, it's because she was a distant cousin of Terry Guillory. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. I I wonder if there's not more because finding a body in a swamp, mm-hmm. I feel like is a one in a million shot. Mm-hmm. Because the swamp is where you go to hide it because it sinks down yeah. in the bog and the crocs eat it and the gators get them. And- yeah. Um, it should be a one in a million shot. Apparently here it's <laughs> a one in a It looks like, yeah, it looks like. <laughs> it's I like know. eight to one. Uh, uh, a few so of them look white, Harrison, and then. There's two black women and oh, okay. six white women. Yeah. When you, uh, one thing I will tell you about this area is that it's Cajun country. And so these are descendants of the Acadians who were French Canadian who settled mm-hmm. in Louisiana in the 1700s. Um, I know this because I teach some of the stories that I teach in American Lit, one of them in particular, or two of them in particular at the Cajun Ball and um, the Storm are uh, take place in those time periods with um, Acadian um, descendants. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the, it, it, Acadians are what are partly what we consider modern day Cajuns. Um, so you can see how the, the word broke down into that. There's yeah. some other cultures mixed in there. But the, the Acadians were uh, seen basically as one step at the time in the 1700s and even later on were seen as like one step above slaves. And um, it was really hard for them to assimilate into, quote unquote, like white. White society. Yeah. The definition of whiteness has changed radically over even the last century. Yes. It's um, like who's white and who's not. Right. Yeah. Because it's a construct. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, so that area, you'll see like a, even a lot of the girls' names ha- have French derivatives um, mm-hmm. A lot of the people in the in the town, their names have are are derived from French because their relatives were probably Cajun. And um, there's definitely this idea, this separation between I hate to say Cajun and white, but I don't I don't know how else to say it. It's, you know what? It's kind of like a subculture, like mm-hmm. Appalachian. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's like a cultural group. Yes. Um, so if you're Appalachian or if you're Cajun, yeah, it's different. You live a little bit differently or even Amish. Yes. You go yeah. like, okay. Way yeah. Down. It's, yeah. It's not a race. It's just a cultural different kind the of cultural difference. I don't know how to, the, but the, the, when you watch the documentary, you can see the difference. You can hear the difference. Oh it's, yeah. Th- what's interesting is every time I had to start and stop the documentary, the first couple of lines that I went back to sometimes if it was in the middle of an interview, I'd be like, I, I just don't even know what he said. <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah. the people they interview you, it's it's only when you're watching it for a little while that you pick up on the yeah. what is being said, the accents, the dialect, and even truly the way of living yeah. is so profoundly different. The other issue uh, with the area in which they're living is that Jennings is sort of separated into two halves, the, the north and the south. Um, and north... Jennings is all of the posh. Mm-hmm. I don't even call them McMansions because they're bigger than McMansions. They're like Mick, Mick, Mick. Yeah. <laughs> they're huge, like palatial places where doctors, judges, governor, like not governors, but people in government work. They're just like really, it's really kind of gross because they're like not even, right. in some cases, nice plots of land. It's like a flat, nothing piece of land with this giant 
monstrosity growing out of it. Of course. Of course. Why have taste when you have money? <laughs> when you're um, new money. <laughs> would, that being said, I would love to see inside of them just to see how terrible oh, yeah. they are. Um, and then Je- South Jennings is like, it's literally a train track. You know how they say like the wrong side of the tracks? They're literally train tracks. And on uh, and South Jennings is just abject poverty. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. shanty homes that are fall. Some of them are falling apart. They're tiny, tiny little spaces that you can't even imagine that you could fit a family inside of. And sometimes extended families are living like like that plus a trailer on the lot. Mm-hmm. Um, just broken down. Just really, it's a really, really impoverished area, and that is separated by a black side of town and a white side of town, of even course. though the sides sort of coalesced a lot when it come, came to drugs and sex work, um, they ha- still live separately. So it's very, very bizarre, very um, established area where it's just like, you don't go here, you don't go there. Everyone has their place. And there's a lot of looking down on the people of South Jennings. Yeah. It's like trash. And I, I'm using that word. It's not my – it's not my word. Right, it's right, not, yeah. You know. Um, and so to go back to the story, um, I wanted, like I said, I wanted to kind of tell the story of the ladies and then kind of weave back in because it's there's a lot. So Ernestine Daniels Patterson was 30 years old, and she was discovered six miles from where um, Loretta's body was found on June 18th, 2005. Her body was also discovered in the water. Um it was discovered, I don't know why this this interested me, but it was by a group of froggers who were catching bullfrogs for dinner, oh. which I didn't oh. know people oh. did. <laughs> frog's legs. Frog's <laughs> legs is a delicacy. I didn't think it was the kind of thing where you go out and get frogs and cook them up that night. Where do you think frog's legs come from? I know they come from a frog, but I thought like, you know, you go to the store. <laughs> we do. <laughs> I didn't know people caught their own frogs to eat. It was a revelation for me. And it was just like, it was sort of like one of those, like, in a book of terrible, like a charming detail of like, right. like let's go get some frogs to fry up for dinner. <laughs> yeah. It was just like two boys catching frogs, like the most innocent thing in the world. Right. And unfortunately, and also then, uh, P.S., if there's bodies in that, don't eat the frog. Don't eat the frog. Please. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, but, um, Anyway, her mother uh, said that her throat was slashed and her hand was bruised and her face was unrecognizable. Mm. It took authorities two months to positively ID the body due, due to the level of decomp. Remembering that Louisiana Louisiana is super – it's so hot. And, and humid. And if you're putting the body in the water, then you're just like – so the decomp yeah. is going to be severe regardless. And then putting it in the water is going to be uh, more uh, intense. Uh, Ernestine was originally, she was tiny. She was like 85 pounds and 5'4". She was so skinny. And she was just like a tiny little woman. And she had previously been, oh, she's the one with four kids. She was married with four kids, was a church-going woman, and then just fell into a sort of bad time. Um, yeah. She had some mental health issues and she became addicted to drugs and same, same as similar to Loretta and where her, her life kind of fell apart. She ended up living with her mom and her four boys lived there with her and she started doing sex work uh, to feed her drug habit. Um, unfortunately, crack cocaine was a lot of what smoking crack was a lot of what these women were into plus pills and all that kind of stuff. So um Sadly, she – so all the women are kind of related in some way. They kind of – they either are, like, literally related by blood in some mm-hmm. way or they just knew each other. Ernie yeah. was kind of on the outskirts of that. She wasn't as well enmeshed with everybody. But uh, one of the later victims is, is um, thought to have been – in the area, meaning like right outside when Ernestine got killed. So Ernestine was, um, the, the author Ethan Brown has done some digging. And what he discovered is that there's two men 
their names I think are Jones and Dixon, but like I said, the men, the men's <laughs> names sort of mean nothing to me. So okay. it could be Jones and Nixon. Uh, but they uh, hired Ernestine for sex work. And the story is that one of them, there's, they kind of like, there's, the story is, is, is hard to ascertain because nobody's really saying what happened. But essentially that one of them was um, with, with her in an abandoned home that she often used as a place for her sex work and mm-hmm. um, ended up strangling her and that the other one helped. So it's hard oh. to know. And, th- and it said that sh- they wanted to both have sex with her and she r- had refused. So who knows? Who knows? Um, but what has been corroborated is that the wife of one of them says that that day they, they both showed up at her house with a trash bag that was like as heavy as and the shape of a body and that blood was pouring from it and they left it on the back porch. And then later she had to clean the blood off the porch. Um, So these two men, it's likely that they killed her. Yes. Um, Uh But the police didn't investigate the place where she was thought to have died for like months. So any evidence was gone. The two men. Why is that? Was it just that they didn't get that information for that long? Uh, no, they had the information. They just didn't do it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so okay. It, 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 dragging their feet is one of – is the least of what they, they've done in this mm-hmm. case. And I'm, I'll go into it more. Remember, the warden is having sex with right. people in there. So that's right. the kind of place – that's the kind of what we're dealing with. Um, so uh, Muggy Brown, who is one of the later victims, is, is a cousin of one of those two men. Dixon slash Nixon and Jones. And she was said to be there when Ernestine died. Hmm. So um, anyway, charges were eventually dropped because of lack of evidence against the two men. So most people believe that even though those two men probably killed her, um, that um, there's no one has ever been convicted of her murder. Yeah. Um, Muggy Brown, this is just a side note was often getting into trouble with her cousin. At one point she brought her friend, her friend, she and her friend um, went, were like out using drugs all day. I think they were like, I don't know if they were smoking formaldehyde. They were doing something really. Oh heavy. yeah. There's one. It's, I forget what it's called, but yeah, you put like pot in formaldehyde and then you something like it. this. They were doing it all day and they were driving back from Houston and her friend was sort of just like passed out in the back and they wanted Muggy had stolen a stereo and wanted to sell it for money to get weed so that they could like come down off of whatever they had done. And so Muggy takes her friend to her cousin's house and says, okay, let's go in. He's just going to give us marijuana. And I'm I'm sure she didn't say it like that. (laughs) Let's go in. He's going to give us marijuana. Right. Um, And so they go in and when the friend goes in, she goes into, um, when she goes into a back room with her, with Muggy, Muggy leaves the room and immediately this guy comes in and rapes her. And he says like, basically that he, in order, he just gave the other people in the house drugs and basically they sold this girl for drugs. Mm. So she gets raped and, um, the three of her dad is um, an investigator. The woman, the woman who got raped, her dad is like an investigator for a company. Like he's not a police investigator, but he does other investigation work. Okay, and he does his own investigation. And the actual, actually, the three people involved, the rapist, the cousin, and Muggy, all get charged with um, rape. And but right before the trial, they start harassing the woman who was raped Mm -hmm. she ends up dropping the charges out of fear Mm -hmm. so that story doesn't necessarily go anywhere like again but it shows you the kinds of inner workings of the groups uh, yeah yeah this group and so even one of the women who died is kind of sketchily involved sometimes or being coerced out of the promise of drugs Mm -hmm. her cousin's a bad guy and (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. It was Byron Chad Jones and Lawrence Nixon. So it was Nixon. It was Nixon. Um, um, yeah. And they were arrested for a second degree murder, but they dropped the charges. Um, the next woman, girl, really, is Kristen Gary Lopez. She's 21 years old. She is uh, a, a girl, woman, person that the author describes as she has learning disabilities and some intellectual disabilities. She actually competed in the Special Olympics when she was younger. So she is sort of, and she's sort of like, I, they describe her in a way to show that she's not, I don't think it's to with cruelty that they describe her, but they're kind of showing like how unprepared she is for this world that she's sort of been so yeah. in. Like she has like a, like a, uh, like her hair's cut erratically, like with too much forehead and she's kind of gawky and awkward. Like she's only 21. Yeah. And she's clearly got some issues going on. Like at face value, she's not like, and she's not, she's, she has a lot of, um, things going on in her life that sort of complicate her ability to understand, like, basically, like, she can be taken advantage of very Yeah, quickly. yeah. Um, she is the third murder. Um, her body was found March 18th, 2007 in a canal and was in the water for several days. She had been missing for two days uh, before that. And a lot of times with these women, unfortunately, when they were missing, their friends thought that they were on a bender because it mm -hmm. would not be unlike them to get yeah. away and not be seen for a couple of days because they yeah. were using drugs. Yeah. Um, da, 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 da. So her friend essentially helped a lot of these women, um, especially I think Kristen, um, their parents also were addicted to drugs in some cases, not all, not Loretta and not um, Ernestine. But in this case, her parents really weren't around to raise her. So she was like sort of raised uh, by mm -hmm. people in the community. And she just ended up falling into, and yes, yeah, she would be smoking crack with her, her father sometimes. Mm, that's so um, and then even her father told her that she was using too much crack and she should slow down. And I wow. think in the documentary, he even says like, but how can you tell your daughter not to do something that you are doing? So we have just like a community like riddled with drug problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so she ends up, you know, going out and sort of doing sex work for, for drugs and she hooks up with this guy that you're going to hear his name a lot also. It's Frankie Richard. Frankie Richard is a very big and dominant player in this world. He is the person who is turning girls out for sex work. He basically like orchestrates most of their – Yeah. Or gets them – gets them, I guess – I guess eventually they take control over their work, but he's the one that sort of gets them started. Like, I have drugs. If you want these drugs, right? got to do this for me or, you know. So Frankie Richard is kind of – and he's always kind of like – he when he was younger, I think he worked for the oil fields and or oil rig company, but he's went to a life of crime pretty early on and was a heavy drug user, a pimp. Um, and everyone pretty much seems pretty scared of him in this town. Mm, okay. Um, and he's the kind of person when they interview him, you really have a hard time understanding. He is that deep. deep oh, that Cajun. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, with it, that last name, Richard, you know, it's very, it's very French. Um, so you, I just picture like the family, like going down, I picture like the thick Cajun upbringing, you know, but I don't know, but that's how like you, you get the whole lifestyle. An all around great guy. Yeah. Hard. yeah right. Right. Um, so <laughs> winner. <laughs> and so she would call him, Kristen would call Frankie Richard, uh, uncle Frankie, even though that was not mm -hmm. her uncle. And so a lot of these women were hanging out at Frankie's home and doing drugs um, a lot of the time. And what happened was that Kristen and her friend Tracy Chasson, who is Loretta's cousin, uh, were hanging out a lot together and that um, they tended to, they got into trouble with some other Johns and they got beat up pretty bad. So they were sort of like afraid. Mm. And um, so they would stay with R Frankie Richard for like protection kind of. And yeah. now this is not 
this is not canon, but according to Ethan Brown, uh, um, what's her name? Kristen was hanging out with at Frankie's for like a while and he thought that she was stealing from her from him so he like didn't want her to stay with him anymore Mm. and um according to sources for the police um frankie said that he wanted oral sex from her and Kristen said no and because of that he had tracy hold her down while he choked her to death. Mm. This is the rumor. He, Frankie Richard is interviewed a lot throughout this and he swears he didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's dead now, I should say. Okay. But I still don't want to accuse, I don't want to, you know, he's a, right, lot, right. a lot of people feel that he is the one that did it. There's a lot of people who came forward and told the police. Um, there is a story so the police, there's a lot of corruption in this story. And the police um, had a lot of witnesses who won't even, who aren't named because they're too afraid, mm-hmm. go to the police mm-hmm. and tell them the stories. And there's one story in which there is a woman who was supposedly there, there that one night. Christine, it's her last name. <laughs> Cyber- That's Cajun. Christine Sile or Sale or something. Sorry. And she um, she was supposedly there that night and they used, supposedly used her car to dispose of Kristen's body. Oh. Now, later on, one of the people working at the jail supposedly bought, when Christine was a, an inmate there, he supposedly bought the car from her had it washed and completely cleaned out and then resold it. When the rest of the police found out what he had done, he got in trouble. But did he get fired, Andrea? Of course not. Of course not. No. What do you think that they did with him? Did he, did he get promoted? He got promoted to being in charge of evidence. Yep. Yeah. That's not uncommon in police forces. They never get fired, first of all. <laughs> and so, yeah, when somebody is, seems like they are basically cleaning out evidence and getting rid of it, why wouldn't you make them in charge of all the evidence? So that's what they did. Um, and so that they so they believe that Frankie Richard was guilty and they believe that the they believe Frankie Richard is not only an informant for the police, but like a well taken care of well taken care of informant for the police and that is why they got rid of the evidence later um tracy richard would or tracy chasson who again is the cousin of loretta would come forward and say that frankie and his niece hannah um killed Kristen. Mm. and the next victim which we'll talk about in a second however um tracy recants her story later and um, murder charges are dropped against the two of them. So it's either that he gets arrested and then charges are dropped or he gets arrested and then all of a sudden gets out of jail and nobody really understands why. Mm. And there is footage or, or audio of the police saying to um, one another, like, oh, don't worry about Richard. He's, he works for me. So there's definitely recordings right. that are suspicious. There's also like – this this author also obtained like um what do you call it like when they sit down with a interrogation sorry of Frankie Richard and it's so softball that you're like something is weird but they he swears he's not an informant the police swear swear, swear he's not an informant but for some reason he always gets out of trouble and is always like the center of everything but somehow never gets arrested for anything yeah yeah and I think in the early 80s, he is con- he is suspected of having stolen like pounds and pounds of marijuana out of the um, police um, station. I guess they had drugs stashed there from that were confiscated and nothing was ever done about that either. Mm. So <laughs> draw your own conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> the next uh, person who the next woman who died, Whitney Dubois. Um, she was now, unlike the previous victims, her body was discovered along a rural road and she was totally nude. Um, 
so they think that so the so the story with Whitney Dubois. So Whitney Dubois has a really sad life. Her parents essentially abandon her when she's a child. Mm-hmm. She is raised by another family who has there's people in the family who I think her brother is like selling drugs. Like it's it, drugs yeah. are so prevalent and all over the place. But Whitney sort of is she gets this boyfriend who she's one that I was talking about. It's like she loves her boyfriend and they're really close, but at the same time. Uh, the police are called to her hotel room one night because he has stabbed her in the head with a screwdriver. No. Yeah. But they continue to stay together. Leave so. him. Leave <laughs> him. And I don't Minimum. remember his name because I don't care about what his Yeah. <laughs> Minimum, do not date a person who will stab you with a screwdriver Minimum. or any tool or at all. You. Even hold no stabbing. in your direction. That's yeah. It. Just that's a breakup. Yeah, that's a deal breaker. Um, she had a daughter. All these women had, I know, Harrison, um, yeah. all these women had daughters uh, or children. She had a daughter who was like the lover because she never really had a family like her. Mm-hmm. So she, when she was, um, when she went to live with the, the um, Dubois at two, her, so her parents were too drug addicted to take care of her. At two, the court said that she had to go back to her parents. And then for the next couple of years she was basically physically and sexually assaulted by her mom's series of boyfriends yeah um, and then ended up back at the Dubois so it's just sort of like bad on top of bad happened her daughter was like the light of her life because it was finally like her own family Mm -hmm. Uh, but because of her relationship she just was you know she was getting into trouble her her boyfriend was a known drug dealer and user and um, because of that, she spent a lot of time with Frankie Richard. And mm. they say that she ended up dead not long after having a very public argument with him. Mm. Um, and the, the tricky thing about the way she was found is that there's a guy who um, was in the car with the, the – so there's a known associate of Rick, Frick, uh, Frankie Richard's named Lula, who knows. And he was driving this other guy around for drug things. They were looking for crack, I think. And there was a body in the road. And the witness is like, there's a body in the road. And this guy's like, I don't see a body. What body? Mm. I'm just going to drive around that body. Hmm. um, So he never said anything. And then the next day, that very guy who ignored the body was the one who identified it on the road. So, and that guy's a known associate of Frankie Richard. So it's kind of like. What's wrong with finding it a few hours earlier? Right. Right. I don't know. I don't know. uh, Don't try to assign logic. Right. Maybe he wasn't told he was going to be the guy that identified the body. Yeah, yet maybe, at that he time. Felt, maybe he felt pressure because he knew the other guy saw it. So he was like, and it was laying yeah. in the middle of a road, but it was the kind of thing where it was like, he clearly knew the body was there the whole time. Right, right. So, if you drive around it, you're telling on yourself. And they think that he was also there when Whitney got killed. So it's believed that Frankie Richard killed both of those women. It has never been prosecuted. He died. He, he and he would Frankie Richard would insist that he didn't. He even took a polygraph, which was inconclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, so and what's funny is when you see him speak, like you know that he's lying, but on some level you're like, did he? But he did. Like, you know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. You're um, so you're definitely sure that he did. It's like you don't. It's like. Who else? But at the same time, maybe not. Yeah. So many bad actors in this story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next person who dies is Muggy Brown. She's the one who had her friend raped. And she was also the one who was outside of, they believe, Ernestine's murder. Mm-hmm. Um, she knew the four other girls. Um, and she would, but she was really paranoid. She had spent time. She kept saying that something bad was going to happen to her. Um, she, she told her grandmother the night that she went missing or the night before. Yeah. The, the, that she disappeared rather right after she told her, her grandmother, she was going to have some gumbo at her friend's house. Um, she had a young son and she lived with her grandmother. Her grandmother's the one who raised her. Um, and her grandmother said that she had just like fallen in with the wrong crowd. Um, she was, you know, doing lots of crack cocaine and she was like getting in bad with her cousin. Her cousin, like I said, was the one who, who um, had her set up her friend to get raped. Um, 
And so, but they also say like, she was the toughest, like she was the one of all the crowd that would like kick your ass. You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah, the yeah. one. So her being murdered was like very scary and eye opening. This is also what the fifth, fifth person to die. Right. Um, she also, they say when she was found that she looked terrified, she had a look of terror, terror on oh. her face. Um, and her body was covered in bleach. So whoever like left her wanted her not to be um, identified. Right. Um, the next person is Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno. A lot of these people have very long names. Probably Benoit. <laughs> uh, Benoit, yeah. sorry. Probably right. Benoit. Okay. You, know what, you know why I did that? Because I went to high school with a girl named Sarah Benoit, and that's how she pronounced it, even though it's Benoit. Yeah. Well, in New Jersey, all bets are off with pronunciation. Right. And I knew it was Benoit, but it was because when I see that, I automatically think Sarah Benoit, which is not, <laughs> which is probably Sarah Benoit. And yeah. I wonder if she changed it in adulthood. But anyway, neither here nor there. So she was a 24 year old mom. She was the sixth victim. Um, her story is like the others, just terribly sad, hard life. Um, you know, dr she fell into the drug and sex work scene. Um, she um, had to be identified through DNA because her body was so badly decomposed. She was actually found in the woods um, mm -hmm. on the uh, in 2008 when they found her. Um, the weird thing about her disappearance is that Terry Gilroy was the last person she called before she disappeared mm. and mm. That she when he came to her house and told her parents her mom her he said he now she hasn't been identified yet this just happened and she won't be identified for two weeks but he said i know it's crystal and she said well how and he said well i recognize a tattoo on her on an intimate area and her mom was like ew what do you mean <laughs> ew ew you jerk store oh, god mm -hmm. So how would, how would he know, you know, unless he, and she had been in and out of jail. She was an informant of his, all of these women were informants. Interesting. So that's a problem. Interesting. One of the things about being an informant is that they were able to not only have their past eradicate, in other words, like they could get, they could get uh, sort of things overlooked for things they had done. They could get things overlooked for things future things. So, and they could get it like Terry Gilroy, I think, oh no, this was for another, this is for later, uh, for one of his other vic or not his victim. I'm sorry. One of the other victims, um, would say like, if you want to get out of jail, you have to sleep with me kind of stuff. Uh. Another really gruesome thing while we're talking about him is that Terry Gilroy, um, let me see. Wait, what was I going to say? Oh, there was rampant accusations of sexual abuse in prison and sexual harassment in prison. This was rampant. This was like, oh. yeah. And the the nurse at the prison testified on the behalf of one of the women who came forward that she was being sexually assaulted by this off this um, what do you call them? The people who guards. Were, yeah, and. Terry had her, Terry basically had that nurse shamed, said she was lying. He had her lose her job, her license, like basically mm -hmm. her life because yeah. he had tried to support this woman. And in the end, that that officer or guard ended up killing himself, which is sort wow. of like, it's just, it's just, it's just awful. Like they're just awful. Um, there's another Terry Gilroy story I'll save for a couple minutes uh, later, but, uh, Crystal. So Crystal, there's a man who actually witnessed three men dumping Crystal's body in the woods. Um, they were three known, they call them, um, body men of Frankie Richards because they're willing to put their hands on your body. I never heard okay. of that before, but body man. Um, I don't know why you'd want, okay. I don't know why you'd want that, but I'm not in, I'm not, Crime. They they will physically remove yeah. people. They will do the work. That, yeah, Frankie Richard won't mm -hmm. do it. He'll get someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway, oh, so um, now this guy came forward and said that he saw that, but strangely, no, um, 
no um nothing was ever done about that hmm. and those guys were just able to hop on out of the woods no nbd um the sad thing about crystal is that they say her body was her body was posed in a way with her left hand out um and looked like she was trying to like stop whoever had oh god which is awful 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 yeah um Brittany Gary what so so Crystal was friends with Brittany Gary Brittany Gary is only 17 years old oh man a baby she's a little baby Um, And she looks like it. When you look at her picture, you can tell which one she is when you look at the eight. She looks like a little girl. Um, Unfortunately, Brittany just – Brittany had an upbringing that was tumultuous. Her mom – and her her mom had a hard time paying for her, like supporting her and her siblings. They had moved around a lot. Her dad tried to get custody of her and her siblings at one point because they, he said the mom was neglecting them because he would come to get them for his custody time for custody. And her mom would say like, I don't know where they are. Oh, they were like just running around and they tried moving around a lot, but eventually her mom, Teresa, and her moved back to Jennings because that's like that's where Brittany knew people and she felt like, you know, she had her friends there. Unfortunately, she um, also – oh, and she was – where is it? it? Looks like somebody – oh, Brittany Gary. So she's a cousin of Kristen Gary Lopez. That makes sense with the name Gary. Um her mom, they, they sort of just had, you know, no rule, kind of no rule. She was yeah. out doing drugs. She was doing sex work at age 17, which is oh. tough, tough, tough. And it was to support a drug habit. Um, the last, the person that they think is guilty of this, the mom in this is so um, devastated by the loss. The last time that she was seen, she went to a, uh, she went to the family dollar store to buy phone minutes for her phone and jeans. And that was Sunday, November 2nd, 2008. And then her body was found. Gosh, TBD. I'll tell you when it was, it was, um, it was found on a side of a road, I think. Um, she, um, the last person that, that they think they saw her with is this guy called Danny. Where the fuck is his name? Sorry, I'm just looking for his name. Danny Barry. Danny Barry was a jailer at the Jefferson Parish Jail, but, and he was accused of having abused inmates. Um, and this is like corroborated over and over, but he also, um, he and his wife would enlist girls all the time to smoke drugs and have sex. And he even had like a dungeon in his one of like a dun- I call it dungeon, like a yeah. room in one of his things where he had like handcuffs at the ceiling and just like torture devices. And so girls would go over there and smoke drugs with him. And then he would basically not let them leave and keep them locked up in that room. For yeah. And they think that that's what happened to Brittany, which is beyond beyond right so upsetting especially the fact that she's like she's not even illegal she's not even legal she's 17 years old yeah she's a baby there's so much entitlement to women's bodies in this Mm -hmm. story Mm -hmm. like more than usual Mm -hmm. more than just the baseline cultural misogyny but like this town this community this kind of like the actors the bad actors in this just kind of have this disregard but it's like it's not even about the sex work in this. It's about just the whole t- the whole community has basically said like if you're a woman here, these are the ways in which you can survive, and the choices are right. bleak and bleaker. Like there's not really like it seems like the drug addiction comes out of just absolute poverty and peril. Like it doesn't seem like yeah. they really have a choice, and, and there may not be that, anything but- else. There may not be anything else to do in that town as far as job wise to make money. Yeah. Besides mm-hmm. selling drugs and getting into that. Right. Because that's, I think it's sort of the, yeah, the only way livelihood. And it's such a huge subculture that it sort of takes over. Like it's, especially like these eight women, these eight women are all interconnected in some way. Mm-hmm. 
Um, they all spent time with each other. They all knew each other. And, um, and so it's so insidious and it's sort of like the men, I hate to say like the women didn't have agency, but they, they really were at the mercy of, of the yeah. men. In story. Yeah, they really were. Yeah. Nicole Jean Guillory is the final victim. Um, she, like I said, is a distant um, cousin of Terry. She's the only one. She was found along the side of Interstate 10, um, which is it, in, in a nearby para, um, sorry, in nearby Acadia Parish. She's the only one that was found outside of Jeff Davis Parish. Um, um, her, she, so right before she disappeared, her mom was going to bake her a birthday cake and asked her what kind of icing. And she said, mama, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be, I'm not going to be here to see my birthday. Wow. Um, um, uh, before this one informant in the, or not informant, one witness in a jail who came forward said Nicole Guillory was going to die. And it, like, not in, as a threat, but as like a right. Woman. And wow. nobody ever took it seriously. And they were, and she did die. Um, she was afraid of the police. Um, but at the same time, she spent a lot, a lot of time in prison. Her mom said it's almost like her second home. Like she would do things to get caught and get sent to jail. Hmm. Her, the Terry Guillory, this is the grossest ever. Um, Terry Guillory would say that she had to have sex with him to get out of jail and also to get her boyfriend, Michael Prudhomme, out of jail. And Terry oh. Guillory is a distant co cousin of hers. So that's what makes it really yeah. dark. I mean, I feel like everyone there is distant cousins of yes. everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, she also had, te there's testimony of hers um, in some sort of setting about the sexual abuse going on in the prisons. So she, like the problem with all these women is that they're, they're sort of related, not only in just their, their life. I hate how they call it a lifestyle. I know <laughs> it drives me like it's your aesthetic. so many times in this. And I'm like, they're not boating. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a lifestyle. It's, right. it's a life. Yeah. At any rate. She, um, but she, uh, was like going to say, oh, so like, so Muggy Brown, they say was saw Loretta's body before the police did. Like she saw it in the canal. Um, a couple of these women were witness to a police shooting of an unarmed man. He was actually just reaching for his, it was at a drug bust and he was reaching for a crack pipe. Oh. Tried to hide it, and the police killed him. Oh. And it was, of course, covered up. Yeah, and, and um, a lot of women; these women witnessed that. So these women were witness to a lot of treachery, a lot of police corruption, which I didn't even touch the surface of the police corruption, really. Um, and just like so, they were like really heavily. They knew a lot, and um, Frankie Richard said of Nicole that she knew a lot about a lot of things. So it, the weird thing about this is that the 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 who you call it the sheriff. Okay, so mm -hmm. sheriff the sheriff in this these towns or towns such as these have tremendous amount of power. They're vote, elected into office, and they pretty much don't have any oversight. And so the 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 Sheriff Ricky Edwards, which I always get confused with Jeff Davis. <laughs> At first, I thought they named the parish after the sheriff. Oh. And I was like, no. Um, Ricky Edwards was that he was, I think, in real estate before he became a sheriff. And he sort of was like very um, negative about the the Jeff Davis eight. He would say like they were they they died because they lived high risk lifestyle. Oh, God, I hate um, that that they uh, were from the wrong side of the track. Like he was really down on yeah. them. And really, if it wasn't for the investigative work of the author who filled out like FOIA requests on people's like work records at the police station, that's how yeah. he got to all of this stuff. Um, so the, the problem with the sheriff is that he came out and said, this is the work of a serial killer. And everyone is like, that's not how serial killers work. Serial killers don't kill people that they know 
Right. And then like in a highly organized network of people who know each other. It's usually random. Yeah. And that there are people who came forward in witness statements naming um, very credible and corroborated stories. And for some reason, nothing is, everything is hidden. Everything is done. There was a police officer who took the story about that stolen truck uh, or that that soul, that truck that was mm-hmm. that Kristen Gary's body was transported in, and he took a witness statement and it was recorded, and the recording disappeared, and he was fired. Wow, he yeah. was actually fired. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. he was fired. Not uh, not the bad person, the person who took the took it took the notes. So Ricky Edwards is sort of like, he made up a task force, but the task force never came to any sort of conclusion. Terry Gilroy's now, now, now like ex-wife rather, uh, was on the, the task force. And she was, there's a lot of questionable activity with, of hers. Yeah. Um, uh, evidence missing, um, you know, things ignored. She says it's not true, but Warren Gary was the chief investigator who um, who uh, purchased the white truck. Oh, it was Connie Seiler um, from the inmate and then sold it. Uh, so he was, fi- I told you, he was fined $10,000 by the Louisiana Board of Ethics and then promoted to become the head of evidence. Um Jesse Ewing was the guy who took the statement and then ended up losing his job. Danny Barry was the jailer who was had this weird sex room, which I hate that story so much. Um, Terry Gilroy, another um, another thing that he was accused of. So, I mean, if it's not enough of everything that he's done and said, um, he also was called in. So there was a, there was a couple fighting and the, the man in the couple is Steven Gunther. And he was having like a domestic just argument, but not like physical argument, just yelling, but the neighbor mm-hmm. called the police for some reason. <laughs> what's happening? It's, but Harrison says promoting the guy for the evidence is like leaving him in charge of McDonald's food. that's going to go missing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but it's also exactly. like not crazy. It also makes right. total sense. Um, the, so, uh, so Terry Gilroy, even though he's a warden is called in on this, on this crime of this couple fighting. Um, the police ask the girlfriend if he has a gun, she says he has a gun, but it's not even like put to get, like he doesn't use. Yeah. Yeah. So Terry Gilroy then decides to storm into the house and says that this guy, Stephen Gunther has a, a gun like pointed at him. And so he shoots him to death. And then he drags the body and leaves it on the lawn for hours of this poor dead guy. And when the coroner does the report, they see that he has bullets in his hands. And they're like, how do you have bullets in your hands? If you're holding a gun. If you're holding a gun, it shows that you have his hands up. Right. Exactly. So it's it's so, it's, and they think that that Stephen guy, now that Stephen guy was an informant, but he would also be seen drinking with, he was like a, he had a bad alcohol problem. He was also seen drinking with Terry Gilroy and they think that he knew stuff that just got him killed. Yeah. Um, I talked about Frankie Richard. Um, the shade there is quite, <laughs> the shade there is quite long and extensive with him. Yeah. Um, the other issue that, that is interesting to note about Jennings, um, or that area is that that interstate 10 is a very highly, um, used road to, um, where drugs are trafficked or drugs are, you know, are, are taken into play. Like, I guess it's the main artery for drug drug trafficking. And so a law at some point it was a law, I guess, that if you suspected someone of drugs and you pulled them over, you could just confiscate what they had um, without with just with prob like with probable cause, I guess. The probable cause would be that they were on that road. Yeah. 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 And so Dateline actually did, and this is in the documentary as well, Dateline actually did an expose where they put, because they noticed that people with driver's license, out-of-town driver's licenses were getting pulled over. One woman 
was driving, she was like, I think she was like going, she was going something really innocent. I want to say it was like a church thing, but it was like totally innocent. She gets pulled over and they end up hauling her in. She has no drugs on her whatsoever. She's like not even in that world. Yeah. They haul her in. They do a cavity search of her. Oh, yep. She really got to settle a lawsuit for undisclosed, undisclosed amount of money. And then another Hispanic couple had the same thing happen. To, they didn't have a cavity search, but they they got pulled over. and, and Ma'am. So, um, so at this time, um, and I think Ricky Edwards was in charge, they were pulling people over and they did it to the Dateline crew. They were mm. pulling over and just basically confiscating like money yeah. they had. and they think that what they would do then is instead of like report the drugs they would put the drugs back on the street mm-hmm. and so like I, I mean this is all stuff we kind of knew but it, it's like when you see it it means so much different because if you have an area that is so depressed by drugs and so drug addled and so many people living so desperately and your police station is the one putting the drugs on the street, it makes it so insidious, you know, Um, it makes it feel like I said, hopeless, right? Like who's the, who's the person that's going to fix this because it's not people that are supposed to fix it. Um, and there was one cop, um, and I don't remember the era, if it was that era or another shitty era of this whole shitty story that actually was, um, um, accused of sexually abusing his daughter, left his, he was in the neighboring parish, left and went to, uh, uh, Jefferson Parish and was sexually abusing people in the jail and eventually got kicked out. So there's so many stories of sexual abuse, of, of snitches getting, you know, yeah, either like doing the bidding of the police and being terrified of them because like Muggy Brown, suppose she told her mom that supposedly she was mur- investigating a murder with a cop and he was paying her $500 to do it. Mm, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, but that's also, I mean, it's not a lot of money, but it's a lot of money for her. And then it's also, why would she be, you know, that just sounds super da- dangerous for her. And they were all just basically in bed with the cops, but also being sort of used and abused by the cops and yeah. by the drug trade, like the drug trade was so interconnected and you have all these body men and all of these, um, the biggest, the biggest thing is that there was a place called the Bordeaux Inn in town. And this is where most of the, it was like a bar restaurant in the front and then a hotel, if you want to call mm-hmm. it that motel mm-hmm. early in the back. And that's where a lot of the sex workers spent, like they would, pick up somebody in the bar and then use yep. rooms for sex. Um, it turns out that one of the owners of it was a Gilroy, of course, and yeah. was a represent, not, he didn't work directly for government, but he was like a, he was like not a spokesperson, but he worked for, um, like a high ranking, um, what the, I'm sorry, I have to look at his name because I am going to get it wrong. Just give me one second. I don't know if it's a governor. So he was with some kind of, some kind of official duties. I'm sorry. I can't remember the guy's name. It's probably better that I do. So anyway, um, some highly elected official, I want to say it's a senator or governor. Any rate, anyway, it turned out that a lot of people were coming forward and saying that 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 high ranking official had been at the Bordeaux Inn and had slept with many of the women. He sued, he sued the author of this book, but after he lost his election, um, because he lost the election because he had this person on his payroll who was like seedy at best. Yeah. Um, and um, after he lost it, he dropped the lawsuit. 
So, and I wish I could remember, you could look it up. The, it's, yeah, it's fine. You can find it through Google. It's pretty easy. But so that's the biggest, uh, there's like, as you can see. Oh, they're just being a dick. Ignore them. Oh, sorry. I was like, what? Yeah. I was like, oh, someone has, fine. oh, someone has an asshole problem. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I am rambling. So the the bottom line is that you have all of these women. It's definitely not a serial killer. Their families are devastated. They just, at the time of this, which is probably, they, I think it was like 2010 when it came out, they had a new sheriff who um, campaigned on the promise of solving it and then got into office oh. and then... Oh, man. They were claiming that they don't sorry i keep reading i'm just gonna cover this they keep claiming that uh people won't talk to them and mm, could be. very well be because people are sort of coming away with this idea that um you know the police nothing like witnesses end up getting hurt the police right. you know the murder kept happening it happened it started happening then with people who were closer to frankie richard and the drug trade and all that stuff and um and so murders don't stop happening their clear rate for murder by the way is seven percent the national That's average is 60 something which is holy not holy cow they don't even try at the time of the wow. gen the a time of the yeah, gen ha harrison was, saying he wouldn't talk to them either you end up murder right like it, yeah. there, there's no win there's a no win situation at the time of the this going on there were 20 unsolved murders 20 unsolved murders in a town of 20,000. Right. Oh my God. This is a town of 20,000. So, and these are, they feel like these are connected and that's why they're called the Jeff Davis eight. Yeah. So yeah. They're, they're, they're called that because they're, they're all from this place and they all have some connection to each other. Um, but they're not murdered by the same person. It's obvious that they've all been murdered by different people in the town, but that nothing will ever get done about it because right. people have come forward and said, this is the person who did that and nothing gets solved. Yeah. It's, it's such a shame to see them just like get ignored. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just not cared about. Yeah. And just left. Yeah. It's, it's heartbreaking because these women deserve justice and they're not, I hate to say it, but they're not going to get it now or ever because right. nobody, it doesn't seem like anyone really wants to solve it because the, the benefit that the police and whoever bad actors in that community are benefit so greatly by them not being solved that these women are just, what do you call it? What would you say? It's, um, thrown away yeah, honestly like they're just yeah. like uh, collateral damage that's what it is collateral damage and you want so we all want to think that if something terrible happened to us yes that it would be like all points bulletin and you know never stopping till they found it and this this huge tragedy but it's so infuriating to see it just it's just a matter of whether or not they care yeah. And they can, they can get away with just not caring. It's and so. It's, and again, it's that idea. Oh, well, they're sex workers, but they're not right. like. Is they still matter? They still they, matter. They still matter. And it's saying it like that takes away all of the kind of elements that fed into the, why they live the way they live and how they lived. And like, it, it, it strips away what really the story is, which is right. that no one is investing in the infrastructure of this town, that the rich side of town is doing well. And that the poor side of town, nobody is investing in them to help the population have more jobs, have better education, have better opportunities to stop using drugs and find other ways that there's no investment in them and that they're not the only town this is not the only place it's not happening in a bubble but because yeah. nothing is being invested and that instead the opposite is that they're being pilfered by the very people who are there to protect them that it's just sort of a a, a sad breeding ground and that everyone there has just sort of accepted well 
you keep your mouth shut or you're going to die. Right, right. So Harrison's asking, is there even a way to find out who murdered them? And I mean, so the investigative journalist who wrote the book, the book that we were talking about that you read um, with so much corruption and cover up. Right. So did they come to a conclusion? Did they did they lead to a conclusion? Um, I'm sorry, I have to turn that off. It's just it's distracting me. Um, and, but but they've watched so much of it. Know, it's right? just the thing. You like you could just go away, it. but you're yeah. or just you're giving me. Yeah, you're, you're great. Okay. We're gonna get it. It only helps us. I know. It only helps us. I don't care if anyone hate watches. <laughs> Bring your friends. Yeah. Bring your friends, kiddo. So um, uh, uh, da, 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 da. the conclusion is that he made this to bring attention to it, thinking that he thought, he says in the documentary, I thought the book would change things. This book is right. excellent. Please read it. It is yeah. so, he started with a medium. What's funny is that he started with a medium article and then people started coming out of the woodwork to talk to him. Wow. And he, thought, he has hundreds of hours of interviews. He did all these FOIA requests for all, the, think about all the, he has information on like, on um, work files for all of these folks. Like he knows their deep backgrounds. He got people who in the book wouldn't talk to him to talk to him in the documentary. So he's incredible. His research is impeccable. Yeah. Um, and I I just, I can't say enough, buy the book even just to support him, I would say. <laughs> he says, he, he wrote the book thinking, okay, this will change things. And then nothing yeah. changed. And then they made the documentary thinking like, okay, now people will see this. Right. It's basically like before this, have you ever heard of this story? Like, you no, know, I only heard of it because I heard of it by accident on, um, he did more investigation than the authorities. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He was oh, the person. Good. Yeah. So every, every case like this, there's, it's, it's not because of, um, like do a lot of times it's not because of dogged, like, police work when it goes so long yeah. it's because there is a person it's either a family member or someone who gets obsessed with the case who is like i'm gonna figure it out mm -hmm. and it so he's trying to be that and it's like it's so random what gets picked up like if mm -hmm. this if the book and the documentary had become the next making a murderer mm -hmm. then yeah then yeah but it just like but it's women it's eight women who are sex workers it's really hard and, like, and it just reason, didn't spark yeah. Yeah. And I think the I think it's very hard because these are people who live in very, very bleak poverty and they're not like heroes. You know, they they all did things that were yeah not great. And so you're not like you're taught. It, it's the kind of thing where people are just going to go, eh. You know, oh, well, yeah. That's, oh, yeah. how could people, because I could very, very easily see someone saying, like, how could somebody live that way? Or, well, it's their right. own fault. They're all on drugs. Because I think people have yeah. this understanding of what addiction is. They even say, it's either in the book, excuse me, or in the documentary, they say, like, the people in the wealthy areas are also drug addicted, but they just have money to throw at it. Right. <laughs> like, they right. just go to rehab. It somewhere. crosses or, it crosses class lines. It's not it, yeah. it's not a class. Yeah. I'd say like the kids of the people in those big mansions are also drug using yeah. drugs, but they yeah. their parents can shield them. Their parents can send them to an expensive rehab. Their parents can throw money at it. And, and people, they yeah. don't have to do sex work for it yeah. because they have money. Mm -hmm. That's it's, a lot of the thing. I my hometown where I grew up was um at one point, and it might still be, it was the site of the most opioid overdoses in the entire country. Oh more God. than Camden, more than Camden, wow. because it's a middle class town and there's nothing to do. There's absolutely nothing to do. So they would take their money and they would drive to Camden and they would get to, or wherever. I mean, I'm assuming Camden, but like they would buy drugs and do drugs and because there's money where there's money, there's mm -hmm. drugs. Oh, one of my dearest friends in college, he was from a you know a wealthy family in a wealthy town, and he ended up going down. Uh, I mean, he was one of the smartest kids, nice, like handsome, funny, all the stuff, and he ended up getting addicted to eventually heroin and then crack, and 
he, the last time I heard of him, and this was probably over a decade ago, the best job he could get was like night janitor at his dad's job because he yeah. was so, and it, like his parents even paid for him to have that um, implant in his arm. Like they tried, they tried everything with him. Mm. And his sister is also drug addicted. And um, he actually cut it out with an exacto knife. Oh, sweet. And that's why I tell people, like, if you think you understand right. drug addiction, like, that's not, drug addiction. Yeah. That's yeah. – that you – it's not even – I don't think at the point that you're addicted that you're even making choices. It's like being possessed by a demon. Yes. It, it takes it's, over your personality. And yeah. women somehow through poverty or desperation or boredom or who knows – got addicted and or the, got involved with Frankie Richard or somebody in his mm -hmm. in his group. And this is and these are women who by and large, except for like really Ernestine was a very different animal because her family was like God fearing, church going. It's really kind of confusing. And they, it, you know, this guy's limited to what he can know about her past, but it's kind of confusing that she ended up in this world because she truly is the anomaly of the group. Right. Um, but the rest of the girls like had family members that were addicted yeah. and it, they grew up with it and it was, it's just part of life. And so it's very, very hard to go straight in that si situation. And then once you try yeah. it a couple of times, like it doesn't take that much to become addicted to like heroin um, and yeah. these, or pill, prescription pills. A lot of these girls were um, – addicted to prescription pills. And you can even see with uh, that movie that was um, The Pharmacist. He goes, that documentary is really good. It's Netflix. And it was took place in Louisiana right outside of New Orleans. And he talks about how, um, how like as a pharmacist, like he was seeing that they had doctors who were just prescribing pills without really seeing, like they were seeing an unimaginable amount of clients and, and, um, yeah prescribing pills and then people get addicted and then it, it just escalates. And I don't think that people, I think people tend to see drug at people who are addicted to drugs as an other, as something yeah. they could never be as dirty yeah. as whatever. And when you mix poverty with it, I think people have a very unclear idea of poverty and how all consuming it is and how hard it is to get out of poverty. And yeah. I always say when I talk about this with people, I always say it's like you live the way you live truly because of an accident of birth. Like yeah, yeah, definitely. Not some people, but most of us live the way we live because we were born into a certain class structure and that's yeah. generally where we stay. Well, and this country treats poverty like a moral choice so that we don't have to do anything about it. Right. Without and being government. And there's no... And there's no you it has nothing to do with choice, right? Um, right. First of all, any cycle takes. Let's say we were going to go into Jennings and change it. That cycle would have to be broken over generations, right? First of all, and that's not even counting the immense corruption going, right? On, which is so it's so surprising to me that that could continue and that nobody would do anything about it. It's so isolated. It's so isolated and there's no one who has any power outside of it. Like it's its own little, it seems, it seems like its own little microcosm. There's not like um, someone famous or someone powerful or like a state senator. There's, it's cause it's just, it all stays. It all like ferments. Yes. Right there. And it's, it's so, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's frustrating because um, at the end of the documentary now, I don't know because it's been a while, but at the end of the documentary, Terry Gilroy is still. Yeah, of course. In, of course. He's going to be still be the sheriff. Yeah. Um, Where is Jennings? Louisiana. It's Louisiana. Yeah. It's, it's the Jefferson Davis um, parish and it's right down in um, Cajun country. Yeah, it's so so Arcadian slash Cajun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's that kind of isolated mm -hmm. subculture. So there's there's a lot of cultural isolation, and I think geographic isolation. They're, if they're in the swamps, they're geographical isolation. So it's yeah, it's so hard, and it, you can't go in there as an outsider and change anything either mm -hmm. in a small town like that. They so saw it's so 
They yeah. thought that um no, you don't just just go to New Orleans. It's much better. <laughs> right. There's yeah. some corruption, but it's yeah. you know, it's fun. It's, it's fun time. <laughs> <laughs> they, um yeah, and but I what's scary to me is I'm like, okay, well, this is happening in other this is not an anomaly. Yeah. This is a thing yeah. that somebody, one person, look how much work he did to highlight this. And people like this is something that I think everyone should be talking about. This should be famous. This should be people should be clam pe- people should be clamoring to go down there and demand change. Right. It makes me it's it unbelievable to me. Yeah. It didn't spark. It just didn't spark. And the story, and I think it's because of like we said, like it's women. Yeah. Who are addicted to drugs, who are sex workers, who maybe, you know, didn't make the best choices all the time. But like, think about it. If they were in a court of law, is the death penalty what you would give them? Because that's right. essentially what exactly. you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. It's, yeah. Oh. When you're being raped in jail by the people who run the jail, what must you think? And then they have contact with you when it's when you're out of jail. Yes. Because that's how small it is and how interconnected everyone is. And you inform for them. And so you have, and they, they do this, he brings up, which is a total other thing, this, um, this study that was done about informing and how dangerous it is. It is. People die because of bad information and that it puts the person who is the informant in a terrible situation and, um, and it doesn't lead to anything. It doesn't, the, the costs, the benefits don't outweigh the costs. Right. I think. Right. <laughs> right. So a lot of them, they were, it sounds like they were being coerced into working with the police mm-hmm. so that they'd get lighter sentences or sentences expunged or commuted or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they're also being coerced into this other, they were coerced into this sex work for drugs. So at, like, there's no, there's no right answer. There's yeah. nothing they can do. There's absolutely nothing they can do. Yeah. This and story- everyone is out to get them. Everyone is trying to harm them. Yeah. This story makes you feel like I said it's like a hopeless. <laughs> but it is, but it makes it makes me want to do something. But there's nothing I can do, and so it's very right. Except just talk about it and make people aware that it happens. Yeah, I want I want people to to I want I wish this could be more. I wish more people watched it. I wish more people read this. But the book is excellent. The book is really really written well. And something he says, I have a quote from the author. Um, it's from an article for The Advocate where he says to me, and th- there, it, there's ellipses in this, so it was cut out of a longer quote. Uh, to me, justice is nobody having to live this way, the way in which these women lived. There's a greater justice to me than just, okay, we're going to slap some hand, handcuffs on people. Right. This is not to say that people didn't love them. It's to say the way in which they lived, this life so beyond hard scrabble, where do I get a cheese sandwich today? Where do I rest my head today? That nobody has to live that way again. That to me, that's true justice. And I beautifully said. Right, right, right. The system. Mm-hmm. It's the system that creates this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That we're, yeah. I can't believe that I live in a country where that also happens. But I can. Like, I'm not right. stupid, but I can't. I'm mad about it. Right. It's- right. There was just one, there was just a post in the, the neighborhood Facebook yesterday, and I almost commented on it. And I was like, don't, don't get involved in this. <laughs> but it was something they told a long story. They're like, here's how easy it is to descend into poverty. It's like, oh, and then you're living in your car. Oh, and your car gets stolen. And like, oh, and then this and that. And then the bottom is, so that's how you know that you need to be thankful for what you have. And everyone's like, hard, oh, so important, totally important. And I'm like, that's how you know you have to change a system that allows that to happen. Yeah. That's not an inspirational story for you. It's yeah. not to make you feel better about yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's an make, indictment of the system. It should make everyone – I don't understand how you could hear a story like this and not everyone be – at minimum brokenhearted, at maximum like, what do I do? How do – what do I do? Right. What do we do? To prevent this from happening to human beings, that they are, I mean, like he's beyond hard scrabble is, is right. exactly right. They right. have no choice. Their choice is between shit and a bigger pile of shit, you know? And it's like, 
you know, and when you're living, like I said, an accident of birth that you just happen to grow up in an area that's either affluent or just middle class yeah. and you have access to things, you don't have to worry about if you're going to have heat. Like they said, the yeah. jail there has no, no AC. Oh God. There are so many jails without AC. Though. You know, it's that makes me it's infuriating. It's, um, like that, I'm gonna wake up. I know I'm gonna have clean water. I know that I'm gonna be able to take a shower. I know that right. I have clothes to put clean clothes. I have a job. I like. There's right. so many of those things that I am grateful for, but also that I that it's easy to um, take for granted that there are people who can't even make a choice about like where am I gonna eat. I need like Loretta Chesson, I was saying her hus her ex husband, he would like the reason one of the reasons they stayed connected is because he was worried because she would be like, I don't have food. And right. he would give her money for food, which she would like the I think the day that or close to when she died, he would give her money for food and then she would go buy drugs with it. But like you know what I mean? It's that idea of having to choose between A or B. Right. It shouldn't right. be a choice. And there should be some there should be someone and not in, in all kinds of communities where their options are those that there should be some structural changes. And so that there's not, there are so many other choices for them to make. Right. They have, they're not worrying about food, shelter. Right. Education, right. All right. the like, staples. Clean like, water. Those yeah. So that you can work and make a living wage take care of your family and not have to have an option other than drugs and sex work. Right. Right. Cause drugs and, and sex work is going to just, is this a pipeline to police corruption to murder? And it's, it's a shame that it sounds like there were no other options. And like, mm -hmm. you can't, when you're in, when you're in that kind of abject poverty, you probably don't even have the resources to leave. Mm -hmm. So, you don't, there's, ugh, it's like Teresa's mom. Was she, you know, like, did she do all the best things? No, but her job was manager at Wendy's and she couldn't, she couldn't afford to pay right. for her family with that. And so she right. moved back to Jennings where she knew people and was just like, I give up. I can't take care of my kids. So I'm just going to let them fend for themselves. Right. Can you imagine if we had a minimum wage that actually let people support themselves? Right. Right. Like but at the very least. People don't deserve that. I know. I, I know. Then. Um, I, yeah, that's a whole They're like somehow argument. gaming the system. And I'm like, no, they're yeah. just like living. Like when someone says, someone sent to me the other day, or I heard it. I don't know if they said to me or heard it. Like, was, where would I go? But someone said um, that the, the $600 a month um, in unemployment you know, cushion was yeah. encouraging people not to go back to work. And I was like, bullshit. No. <laughs> I was like, that $600 no. is probably not even paying for the insurance they need. Exactly. And I said, who in their right mind wouldn't want a stable job with benefits and like that had one somehow lost it because of the, uh, the yeah. pandemic. And then now is like, Oh, 600 extra dollars instead of uh safety. <laughs> Like, well, and you know what else? If someone doesn't want to go back to work because or because they are getting enough money on pandemic assistance, good. That money is so that people stay home. There is a plague. There is a plague. If you can part. afford to not work, don't work. Stay home. That's the other part. Stay but home. to me, it's insane that people would be like, oh, yeah, I'm never going to work again. And I'm like, no, if I if it were me and it's like you you're still looking for stability. Yeah. Like you're thinking ahead in your future. You're not like, oh, this is going to be forever. And I'm, this is how I'm going to like, it, I was like, absolutely yeah. not. That is not true. And so what if it is? Yeah. You know what? So what if it is? Yeah. We're like, the what? richest country in the world. No, like you're not being gamed. You personally are not being gamed. You know, right. like, you know, who's gaming us like billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was two thousand and four hundred dollars a month that we got during the original six hundred dollar a week yeah. um cushion. And that was only for a couple of months. And that's enough to only pay a mortgage in some places. Mm -hmm. And that is enough to um only pay your college loans for some people. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's like 
it's not a ton. We were not being handed tens of thousands of dollars. It's enough money to feel like right. you don't have to choose between, you don't have to have sleep for dinner because you can't afford food. Yeah. That's the difference. It's amazing to me that people are like, what? You're living medium on the hog? <laughs> Let's take that away from people. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, I, know. I don't know why people think other people deserve so little. That's so- I don't understand. Interesting don't understand. to me. We- it's it's the hard workism I think that we've convinced ourselves that hard work pays off so that if we get something we must be doing hard work and then if someone else doesn't then they must not be. Mm -hmm. Also, is, we can get into prosperity gospel and Christianity, but that's a whole nother show. That's a whole nother show. But it's it's just all bullshit. It's all yeah. Uh, just like this made up. It's like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Not a thing. Not a right. thing. <laughs> right, because some people don't have boots. Right, like it assumes oh, that you have boots. Nobody has ever done that ever. And, and fingers, yeah. and right, <laughs> and you're strong yeah. enough to lift 150 pounds. Right, and, and, yeah. and, and if you're successful nine times out of ten, maybe nine point eight times out of ten, it's because someone helped you get there. Like yeah. you had the money, your family had the money, you had connections and like, luck. It, yeah, there's not like you are not like yeah. It's weird. I, I, it, it, it kind of goes along with like what we're saying about the women in the story. It's just right. like we, we think it, it, our rugged individualism is like eating us alive. Yeah, <laughs> we're not thinking about other people. We're not yeah. loving towards other people. We're not. We don't care. It, not know. Many care about shit. And I get that. Like with all the stuff going on, it's hard to care about. Right. The case, but I mean, I, I just look at it and I think, how could you not just want to scream? Right. I will never understand people who do not care about other people in that way. Mm -hmm. I will never, ever understand it. We're a society. Where's all the, we live in a society people now. <laughs> we don't live to work. We work to yeah. live. Exactly. Exactly. You know, what's interesting about that too. Yeah. I feel bad about taking half a day off because we've been like, I feel bad that I'm not spending every second of my day hustling to try to get freelance money. And my therapist was like, you're doing the best that you can. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's we and it's actually if you if you listen to the 1619 project, a lot of our obsession with like working and productivity and working as much as we can. Actually, it sounds like it came out of that post cotton gin south slavery where it was just you are your workforce is only worth what it can produce and what it can produce is going to be because it's possible to produce more than humanly possible i'm saying possible a lot mm -hmm. they're going to expect that yeah. they're going to expect you to work yourself to death and constantly work and up your productivity mm -hmm. and I, for me, that really felt like that's because that's an anomaly to America. Mm -hmm. That whole, that whole, um, this overworking thing. Uh, my friend, our friend Amanda, she works for a company that's European. It's based in Europe and she gets five weeks of vacation. Beautiful. It, because the, the country is based in Europe. It's amazing. But yeah, so we, we have this idea that that's what we're supposed to always be on the grind. But it's so true. Like if I'm sitting around, which is a lot these days, I'm never, I'm always like, well, I need to be doing this and I need to be doing this. And why haven't I written three books? And why, why don't I have five right. shows? And like, it's right. like, what can I do for crime and cookies? Am I doing enough? Is there anything like how much more can, like, and same, I, same. I, I, like, I am like doing great work and, yeah. and I'm good. I always feel like I'm not doing enough. And then conversely, it makes me tired and not able to do anything because mm -hmm. I'm too depressed about how like, yeah. I'm not successful and I'm not, you know, like all of those, that loop. And it's true. It's like we do, we don't, we only work so that we can have money to get things so that, and then we have to work more. Right. And it's just, and like I said, you're only gathering things so that one day you just have a house full of things that your, your kids are going to have to clean out. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you just, you're just collecting and putting it all away for nothing. It's just, a, and I feel like there's got to be something better. I just don't know how to. Yeah. Well, I think the current pandemic, I mean, it's shaking a lot of things loose. 
Yeah. It's making people realize a lot of things. A lot of things that a lot of things that we used to take for norms don't have to be. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't have to be at offices for the amount of time that they made us. We don't have to, you know, work the way that we thought we had to. We don't have to go places we didn't have to go before. Right. Um, it's, it's, yeah. And so disability activists have been really big on saying, you know, accommodations weren't made for us who had mobility issues, who couldn't go into offices. And now everyone is on Zoom meetings. So <laughs> like you could have always done it. You just didn't. Right. But now we know, we know that we can because we did. So all of these things mm-hmm. are going to change. Imagine, imagine if the 40 hour work week changed. Imagine if so much changed. Imagine if yeah. people were paid a living wage. Imagine yeah. if health insurance was free. Imagine yeah. if work was meaningful and that you, you, the work that you did was meaningful and the extra bullshit they make you do was just, they stopped doing that. <laughs> right. Uh, imagine if you worked because it was, it, it meant something to you and that you you felt like you were contributing to the world. Like, I don't know. I hope you feel like that with this. I do. This okay, is what good. I love to do. This okay, is good. I could do full time. Like if I could do true crime stuff full time, I would. I think that I I regularly kick myself in the ass because I think I chose wrong, and um and now I'm like stuck forever, <laughs> and I can only do true crime as a hobby, and that's just like you know. There's no such thing as stuck. There's no such thing as stuck. I feel that way though. And there's no such thing as there's nothing bad in having hobbies. Yeah, I know. I know. I just like uh I would love to be I would love to feel like I was doing something in the world to advocate yeah. for for victims or like to help so- like I just wish that my work was more geared yeah. toward the the stuff Harrison supports I- you. <laughs> oh. No, I get that. I get that. But, you know, you do what you can. You do what you can. And you have to, and I also have to have reminded myself this, like we, again, as Americans have this individualism streak. We want to do everything as a hero. <laughs> we want to be like the person who swoops in and saves it. Yeah. And what we need to do is alter the systems collectively. We mm-hmm. need collective action and small action. So anything, you know, yeah, anything you do. I feel like I'm going to write to this author and be like, can you teach me a class on researching because you are a genius on it? (laughs) (laughs) He is. I'm like, I, I'm such a nerd that I'm like, anyone who's like a good researcher, I'm like, teach Um, me. (laughs) Okay. Well, that's journalism school. You could go to journalism school. I do want to. I asked my boss if um, I could look into it and she didn't get back to me, but I have to, I probably just have to call her. Circle back. Circle back. Right, to speak the <laughs> office parlance, just circling back to synthesize our thoughts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I need that. I think I think that's the thing I'm missing. And our journalism yeah. teacher is, reti- excuse me, gross, retiring. And so it might be my time to pull up. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm here. But we'll see. I, I have to call her because, yeah, she's busy. Yeah. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Everything's can you fine. Can you, like, audit? classes on your own? Or are you just allowed to do that? Because you might I not can. need the permission. Yeah, I can. I think at this point, I also want to start taking some. I think it's time. I'm deciding whether or not I should do that or take the genealogy course first. Because that's like a, I could just do that. Right. You could do both. I could do both. Not at the same time, just financially. But yeah. Right, right, right. right. I'm thinking yeah. of doing the genealogy first because it's like I just have to go on my phone and right. sign up. Yeah. And that's it's research. That that's a yeah. kind of research. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It definitely is. So there. See, you're not stuck. You have ideas. I have ideas. You have ideas and plans. Look at that. You thought you didn't. Yeah. You thought you were stuck. Everybody Sorry don't that, feel stuck. Yeah. That's your homework. Sorry that I was uh, – to everybody that was a little choppy with that story but there's a lot to it and i wanted to i was like my brain was overloaded with everything i wanted to tell you yeah. it's not it's not a story that you can tell front to back because it's everybody's yeah it's everyone <laughs> it's everyone everyone's got shit in there and there's things i didn't even tell you that are just yeah like, yeah well there's that book that wonderful book that you can um you can buy if you click on the Amazon 
icon above our chat, you can buy that book right now and give us a, a buck or two. Mm-hmm. And support so, Ethan so. Brown, who did amazing work and yeah. should, should be should have more attention. For the amount of work he put into this, he should have a lot yeah. more yeah. attention. You yeah, do well for all those interconnected stories. Yeah. A lot of them. I could have probably just covered one, but then you can't because you don't get the scope. Mm-hmm. The scope of what it and that's kind of the crux of this case is that it was it's really the whole town. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. yeah. And North Jennings being like, oh, those crazy yeah. horse, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, they are the judges and the Officials are also going to that Bordeaux in. Like, go- of course, they're going to that Bordeaux in. I mean, of course, they have the money mm-hmm. to pay. Oh, of course, they're going. I hate everything. <laughs> so, what are you going to do to decompress now? What's everyone going to do after this yeah. story that made us hate everyone? <laughs> I'm watching Virgin River on Netflix. Ooh, how is it? It's stupid, but mm. um, it's very melodramatic. It's it's very soapy and melodramatic, but mm-hmm. in a like more of a lifetime movie kind of way. Mm-hmm. So not like Bridgerton, um, right. but it's good. It's good. Um, it's interesting. It's also a small town. Neil, our friend Neil, um, told me I'd need to watch it <laughs> because it's like right up my alley because it's based on romance novels. But I'm like, okay, fine. Um, I need to. Well, tomorrow I'll. Um, I'm doing the Good Heart Murders on Thursday. <laughs> just all this murder uh it's not as depressing but i'm gonna take a night off from murder uh, cool. and so i'm going to watch something comedy-esque nice. i haven't decided yet and then um i might work on a collage and it looks like harrison's doing the same thing <laughs> watch catfish and doing collage is amazing i love that i love that yeah. for you that sounds so fun yeah, I want to watch something really funny, but I don't know. I know. I have. Really I can't funny. watch the last season of Shit's Creek yet. I'm not ready to say goodbye to it. So that was like my – I'm like putting it off. And I, I tried a couple things on Netflix, and I was like, no, I hate this. <laughs> I was kind of like, I hate this. So I'm like waiting for – I don't know. I might just watch like my standard, like the Goldbergs. Like that show is funny enough for me. Yeah, go um, for it. I don't know if anyone watches that, but that show is underrated. Like that show is very, I think because it's, it's that local, in Philly, it's local. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's what I love about it. Um, and it's very funny. And um, so like maybe watch some of that, maybe some modern family, you know. Awesome. Sounds great. They, I have a dilemma because ID network is now ID go, not ID. It's ID TLC discovery. And I think, so now it's a streaming and it's five dollars a month, which is like, come on, everybody. Hmm. So it's not on cable anymore. It is, but you can't get the extras. Like I love Ninety Day Fiance, but what I love about it is the extras, like Pillow Talk and all that stuff. Oh. And without it, I just don't. So oh. now I'm like, should I pay extra for something I really like? I could probably just like look through my expenses and get rid of things I don't look at. Yeah, and then take the five dollars out of there for something I will get joy out of. For something you love, yeah, yeah. Buy one less latte, millennial. (laughs) Skip your avocado toast one morning and buy a house. I don't do those Um, things. I mean, one less box of corn pops. Yeah. (laughs) No, just one. Just one. Cancel my subscription to the my online subscription to the New York Times. I don't read it enough. Mm. That's eight dollars. That's that's a lot. There you go. When you have double, you have extra to spare. I feel bad. I'm supporting journalism, but. eh. Am I? Uh, am I? You, you get something, right? You get. I'm supporting uh, TLC. Yeah. And ID Network, which is like going to up my true crime. Yeah. So there you go. Don't feel bad. It's for real. to spend money on things. Ooh, actually, um, if we make enough money at this, you can write that off. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me teach you the art and joy of being an entertainer who can write off basically everything you consume. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I was in radio for 10 years. Amazing. So, that's a work expense. Just whatever. Yeah. Everything. So, so cool. Thursday, look for us on Facebook live. We'll have yes. it up on our socials and, um, the good heart murder is, it's a story. So it'll be like a cohesive story. And yeah. Okay. More narrative. It's, and it's narrative. It's got weird uh, twists and turns, and uh, it's not as dark. 
you won't leave feeling like okay tonight it was just hopeless um yeah. and then friday we'll be back here mm-hmm. um doing happy hour we could just i mean i need to make cookies so we can make cookies and talk about stuff i have some true crime news Ooh, that look for true i mean i always could look yeah for i have some stuff to talk about um yeah and bring us your true crime news maybe i'll have more merch to show people mm-hmm. it all depends on when my teespring order comes uh yeah have an awesome rest of your week everyone right yeah thank you for being here yes thank you see you soon thank you yes see you soon